the leader of a different education institution here tonight. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you at part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. As you know, I like to touch base with all the education leaders in this state, whether they're running uh, you know, a local high school or they're superintendents of systems or they run collegiate uh, facilities here. And we've had a good run, a uh, little uh, run around the Mulberry Bush with some of the collegiate educators here over the last couple of weeks. And we like to keep that momentum up. And it's kind of an interesting thing. We, 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 we get so much great consultation from professors at the Naval War College. Uh, on both uh, the television and on the radio show on WPRO weekdays 3 till 6, that it dawned on Lexi and me that we probably ought to check in with how that institution operates and what's going on down there. So we'll talk in, in general about the Naval War College and then we'll uh, kind of pick the brain of its new leader in terms of the Syrian conflict. Not that we're going to get any information as to when a missile might be firing, but just in general uh, get his take because obviously that's still pressing on the minds of Americans right now as to whether the president's you know, pulling that trigger or not. So welcome in. Great to have you aboard. Just a couple of notes on some things going on here locally. Uh, we're going to have to dig into this. I don't think if I lined up 10 people uh, at the Warwick Mall and asked them if they understand what the nuances are of, of, of health care and business in this state, that I don't think any one of the 10 would understand what's going on. Uh, headlines about the announcement with Charter Care today and then one of our terrific reporters showing the press conference with Mayor Grebian in Pawtucket. Charter Care is offered to value Memorial Hospital. You know, Memorial has been, for all intents and purposes, shut down to a skeleton of its or shell of itself uh, based on losing its emergency room and some of the other things that have been shaved back with the ownership saying, oh, you know, can't make any money doing this. Now, Charter Care owns Roger Williams uh, and other facilities and a network of doctors here and for some reason thinks based on if certain things happen it can take over that operation return it to its emergency room plus glory and profit at the same time already we've got daggers flying from different organizations of hospital ownership going on right now and you know politicians that are just kind of salivating over the idea including mayor grevian who has my respect because he does he tries to be a fix-it guy uh, Hasn't got that Paw Sox deal done yet, but uh, he's plugging away and trying. Uh, I mean, they're really salivating over the idea that they can bring that emergency room back because it's, you know, it's a, it's a community need. I don't know how the numbers work. You know, I don't tell you things I don't know, or I don't try to pretend I know them. So we'll do everything we can next week to see if we can dig into this. Uh, you know who's a great resource on this? Ted Nisi, who does such a terrific job on business stuff here. So we will uh, pick Ted's brain and a bunch of hospital administrators over the course of the next week to try to get the answers for all of us as to whether that deal is real and or feasible. All right, on, on another note, just on the political stuff, Morning Consult is, uh, is a polling organization that checks in on various politicians, including governors, across the, uh, the, across the country and <laughs> issues a quarterly report which is often depressing for our own governor, really kind of exciting for the Massachusetts governor. And Charlie Baker once again leads uh, at the top. He's in the top five of the most popular governors in America. Uh, Gina Raimondo is stuck. Here's Charlie. Uh, Gina Raimondo is stuck at 39% in this poll, and it's only going to feed the uh, adrenaline of her opponents. Will it feed the adrenaline of any major Democratic opponent? That's a question that I think is still to be answered. If she's able to run through the Democratic primary and just keep building this war chest, uh, she's still, I think, the odds on favorite to win, just the way the numbers and the politics and the constituency rolls out. But I'm telling you, uh, she can't seem to bump that number to save her life. Uh, I know a couple of ways she could do it. Uh, authenticity might be a good start. A new communications team would be a better start. And I'm just starting, but I don't have time tonight. Uh, we'll talk more about that on the radio as we go. All right, take a look at these three guys. These are three of our most favorite people here on this show. Mark Genest, uh, who is uh, pretty savvy on international affairs. Terry Rorig, who is really, really keen on North Korea and studying there. And uh, 
uh, you know, troublemaker, Tom Nichols, who is, is I, I say that with affection, uh, one of the brightest political minds, but might, might have a phone attached to the top of his index finger. He is the, made the most prolific tweeter. I am sure it will win the award at the Naval War College as the most prolific tweeter. Uh, all of those guys come here, and the first thing we always say is, they're here speaking on their own, they're not speaking on behalf of the Naval War College. Finally, I have someone who can speak on behalf of the Naval War College, and it is, uh, it is my pleasure uh, to introduce to you, uh, for the last 18 months, the guy who runs this place, the president of the Naval War College is Rear Admiral Jeffrey Harley. Admiral, thanks for coming. Great it's to have you. It's an honor to be here. Thank oh, you. No, it's an honor to have you. Uh, thanks for your service. Thank you. To the country. And, uh, I guess question number one is, what do you guys do down there? I think everybody's kind of proud that it's down there, but I don't think everybody really knows what the, what the mission statement is. What is it? So we're the first and, I would argue, best uh, war colleges uh, in the world. And our principal mission is to educate and develop future leaders. And that's what we do, mid-grade officers up to senior officers, and we provide them a critical thinking skill set uh, that enables their best interactions with our civilian leadership. But it's so much more than the education of the 600 individual students per year, and we graduate another 1,000 uh, through distance education, and we have another 5,000 seats always in progress through distance education, and more than 100,000 people enrolled in our distance education programs. But in addition to the education role, we, we strengthen global maritime partnerships because one out of every six students at the War College is an international student. Mm. A significant number of those go on to become flag or general officers, and within that percentage, uh, nearly a third become their actual heads of Navy. So it gives us an enormous partnership, an alliance partnership that strengthens those partnerships. I also think that uh, we're extraordinary in our research arm. Uh, the, the professors that you talk about are not only extraordinary teachers and scholars, but they contribute to the debate on your show and, and many others. And they do that because of our extraordinary research uh, and testimony for Congress and war gaming capability, which has experienced a renaissance here in recent years, a high demand for uh, the lethality and war fighting training and education that we provide. Uh, we support a significant element of combat readiness by providing personnel to support the planners and the strategists at all of our different fleet commands. Uh, so it's a pretty extraordinary role for the college. Moreover, we're the executive agents for all leadership and ethics in the entire United States Navy. Uh, so it's, it is a college. It's somewhat of a university kind of system because of its research arms and the, the contributions that we make to, to the fleet. But we're truly a global command with global responsibilities in support of our great nation and our great Navy and the joint force. Because although we're a naval war college, we have joint uh, professors teaching a joint curriculum to joint students. Is it, is it, that's a, that, that is a lengthy but thorough answer. Did you get all that? You should be taking notes. Um, do you get graded? I, do you get graded in terms, uh, there's, no, there's no class movement. It, it, this, is a, this is a stint. Officers come to the Naval War College for a period of time for a designated purpose, correct? And then go sure. back to, to their active duty. Well, they're, they're actually on active, they're on active while duty they, while they're attending, but we also have a number of students from the interagency, so we have a number of civilian government employees who are attending the college as well. And we are graded in the sense that not only are we fully accredited by the New England Association of Schools and Colleges, uh, but we also have a mandatory joint professional military education curriculum uh, that's directed for us by the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Chief of Naval Operations. So we are great. If you're going to run a fleet, uh, you can't not have spent time at the Naval War College, correct? So the uh, law requires all officers to uh, achieve uh, accreditation within joint professional military education. So many do have the opportunity to come in residence uh, to the various war colleges, whether it's the other service schools or the U.S. Naval War College. Uh, so it, it is a requirement for our career progression to understand the principles of joint war fighting. And first and foremost, 
because that is what we do. We are a war college, so we teach lethality, we teach war fighting, we also teach the constructs of peace and the other elements of national power, uh, but it's all designed in a way that's going to enable a critical thinking skill set that allows us to provide the best advice to our civilian leadership. All right, when we come back, we'll talk about the nature of the, the military, the Navy specifically, and the teaching when we come back, Stu. So, you know, more headlines right now about what may or may not happen in Syria. I'll ask the Rear Admiral what his uh, broad perspective is on, on that potential conflict uh, coming up in, in just a moment. How, Admiral, how much of today's daily news impacts the curriculum of Naval War College and what you're doing? Are you talking, when you talk about engaging in preparedness for war and its lethality and all that, is it more, is it a general conversation or are you, you're looking at today's news and saying, all right, this is what we ought to be doing here. Well, I think it's a focused conversation in the sense that our geostrategic environment is shaped by current events. So not only do we do war fighting about capabilities and, and issues within the joint force, but we're constantly looking at the evolving domains of warfare, whether that's cyber or space or, or regional conflicts like Syria or like China. So I would say it, it does affect our curriculum uh, on a day-to-day, real-time basis. Now, obviously, our curriculum is, is molded in a way that the, the professors and teams of professors, because we, we teach with both military professors and civilian professors, world-class Ivy League level professors, uh, to deliver this education uh, across the domain of, of topics to include uh, these complex issues that, are, that affect our leaders as they go forward. What does the academy do and not do, the Naval Academy for example, do and not do um, in this realm? In other words, you know, on an undergrad level, you know, that's a, that's a collegiate on par exercise, right? I'm sure it is, it is wholly more sophisticated than the average collegiate experience. Uh, First hand, I've got a couple of naval buddies who've been very, very successful in climbing the ranks of the organization. And, you know, you know they got away for a couple of beers during uh, their four-year stint, but a whole lot less time than we did, right? So that being said, what do they get there? But what's missing that they need at the Naval War College? So the U.S. Naval Academy is, uh, is among the top undergraduate institutions in the United States. Uh, it's simply extraordinary at delivering an undergraduate education, uh, but it's formative in its nature. It does provide elements of uh, war fighting. It provides an extraordinary amount of leadership and ethics discussion, but it's a grounding, I would argue, uh, for the average uh, naval or marine officer who's there, uh, naval being both Navy and Marine. Uh, so I think it is that grounding there. Uh, but it is formative years. It is designed to achieve not only the uh, expertise and maritime uh, capabilities and performance, uh, but also the undergraduate degree. What the Naval War College gives you is for mid-grade and senior grade officers, it provides a focused joint professional military education, which is the way that we fight wars. So first and foremost, it is about the war fighting missions uh, that we have and how we're going to achieve It's a fair to say it's like the equivalent of the, the layman's grad school, uh, sort of? Yes, kind of. I, I think that's a fair way to say it. Um, it first and foremost, we do war fighting, then we, right. but we also definitely imbue this thinking skill set. It's the ability to analyze complex problems. It provides a grounding in history like no other. Uh, and we take all these elements t together and it's an update of the leadership and uh, ethics touch points and character development. And you take those pieces together and we do a two year master's degree in one year. So it's pretty intensive, about seven to 800 pages of reading per week. Uh, and the outcome is a, a graduate degree, a master's degree in national security affairs, uh, as well as uh, certification in joint professional military education. How does any one particular administration impact the system of the Naval War College and its teaching? If you mean political administration. Yeah, I mean, we, we elect our commander in chief. Sure. Uh, I, um, I'm not a Trump guy. Uh, this audience knows it. Uh, but I take some solace in knowing that our military and the system is is pretty much foundational in terms of 
how we approach world thinking and the like. And you know, everybody looks at the, the defense. I think most folks look at the defense secretary and go, "Okay, um, that's my personal take." But what it, the system of teaching war, yeah. lethality, and all that kind of stuff? It kind of has its own life, right? Versus sure. what the administration's take might be ideologically. So I think it's continuity and change. So you have certainly have continuity of the principles of the relationships between strategy and policy. Uh, most up to date would be when we're talking about the specific elements of war fighting from a, a joint planner's perspective, because it has to reflect the current strategic environment. Uh, the change might be uh, an increased focus in, in one place or another. Uh, General Mattis, Secretary Mattis, uh, has asked the institutions to provide more lethality, and so we have. We've added a, an additional three weeks worth of war fighting into our curriculum. We study uh, in terms of maintaining the relevancy of your U.S. Naval War College. We study new changes to the geostrategic environment uh, that we haven't studied in the past. Uh, more extensive study of the cyber environment, study of space and unmanned systems, the interrelationships between uh, ethics and technology. All these are, are, are a critical component, uh, but it reflects both that continuity as you're discussing, but also the elements of change that continue to ensure our relevance for the future. That's really a cool answer. I, I, I think what's really uh, fun for us and important for us and informative for us is when we have experts from the Naval War College who often come, the three gentlemen I've seen and others, uh, who are quick to say, I'm not speaking for the Naval War College, and then they will opine very, very, very um, directly and with no fear about what they think about current events, what the president's doing. I had Mark Genest on my radio show just uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact, as we were trying to figure out of this 2448 warning that the president was giving, whether it was you know good, bad, or indifferent, or some other grand strategy. Do you, do you obviously you're embracing within the education multiple points of view. There's got to be some raucous debate that goes on down there from well, time to time. Absolutely. So what we, we really have is a world Do you class wince, by the way, not to interrupt, do you wince over some of these guys when they're telling me that this, that, or the other thing? Or you just kind of you know, keep a blind eye to what they're doing with the media? Or how does that work? I do not wince because the strength of our political system and the strength of a university system like ours uh, is the ability to have free academic debate. And so what the professors at the Naval War College uh, benefit from is the academic freedom to share their own opinions informed by uh, lifelong learning uh, in their uh, specific institutions where they grew up and, and learned uh, th their, their particular trade. No, I don't win. They, they have this academic freedom that we absolutely treasure. It strengthens our nation, it strengthens our maritime services, it strengthens the joint force, it strengthens our very nation. Refreshing. Some current events when we come back. <laughs> Mike Pompeo today uh, with, I, I think for the most part, a rather easy confirmation process, at least so far, I got a chance to watch a couple hours of it. Of course, he is most likely our next Secretary of State coming from CIA, short stint at the CIA. And again, I think the, uh, the political class feels like he's probably a stabilizing force in a Trump administration, which is awful, often hard to predict. Of course, we have a Syrian situation uh, on our hands right now, Russia, Syria, very complicated. Um, you got a take um, on what's going on? Well, so, you know, obviously we watch these issues very closely and, you know, it's absolutely horrifying uh, to see a nation violate international law and all the conventions against the use of chemical weapons. Uh, so it is a, a demanding challenge for the international community. I'm quite confident that our, our president and uh, the national security apparatus is working closely uh, with our allies and partners to determine the way forward in this complex issue. Well, see, I, I, you should, uh, well, you've got plenty to do, but we had some pretty heady conversation on the radio yesterday. Listeners are pretty smart asking a question, which I'm sure probably reflects some of the dialogue that would happen at the Naval Work College on current events, which is why would Assad why would Assad take out chemical weapons on his own people? Why, 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 especially when the president, as little as a couple of weeks ago, was talking about getting the heck out of there, more or less, at least conceptually? And, you know, with Russia so, so intertwined in the middle of this thing, what net benefit would Assad have to do that kind of thing? 
uh, it's a puzzle, and it leads to another question. Well, is it him? I mean, those kind of things have got to be verified. And I think maybe that's some of the time that's going on right now. The president may have spoken first and sent the message and cleared some Russians out of key places. I don't know. What do you think about that? Well, I, it is an incredibly complex issue, and it's dynamic. And, and I watch the press, too, and uh, indications that uh, other nations have proof that Assad actually used the weapons, uh, other sources that at least have doubts about it. So, you know, I, I wouldn't speculate that perhaps, uh, you know, we're waiting for, you know, the appropriate verifications. We're also quite probably uh, working closely with our partners and allies to, to decide, you know, what the right course of action is uh, for the future. But uh, I do know it is a, a horrifying event uh, that should challenge all of us and give us pause that people would do that. You know, in the end, as we teach r all the time at the Naval War College, nations act in their own interests. And Assad is presumably making a calculation uh, that this will slip by the international community. It's a bad uh, calculation. It's a bad calculation. I, I, is he a dope? I mean, I mean I, I, I'm just, you know, I mean, how insular could that calculation be? Especially since at least he got 59 sorties the last time uh, he he went about this. I don't know. It's 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 unanswerable. So I'm I'm kind of uh, transferring you into the the talking head role. How do you feel about the the so many retired military that uh, that play a role across the 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 networks these days? Many of whom have you know conflicting points of view. Is it uh, is the culture that when you got into the business you expected? to see on television? I think uh, my personal answer would be that uh, these retired uh, individuals offer a great technical expertise and that's always appropriate about informing the debate. Uh, I think uh, if it crosses into political domains, uh, that's where in general I become uneasy with it. It's not about, uh, it's not a pr and to me appropriate for people who should be apolitical uh, to comment uh, on political issues, but in terms of providing technical expertise, why not? And, and the more truth we can get into these discussions, the better. Mm. So give me a 30 second uh, message to the community here in southern New England about uh, what they should be thinking about what's going on down there on the island with you guys. Yeah, I, well, I would hope they know um, you know, what we do in support of our great nation and uh, our joint force and, and the maritime services in particular, uh, that we are very supportive of the community and we enjoy the interaction that we have uh, in the great state of Rhode Island. You know, we contribute tens of millions of dollars to the local economy and to the state economy, and we're very blessed uh, in particular to be home here in Rhode Island. And I think it adds to the specialness of a trip to Newport too, you know, to Indeed. see so much naval military, you know, uh, presence. It's, uh, it makes it uh, a really cool place. Indeed. What a great visit. Don't be a stranger. God bless you. Appreciate Thanks. you sending so many smart people up, uh, whether it's your decision or not. We're grabbing them. That's good stuff. Terrific. Uh, have a great summer. Thank Thanks. You. Uh, final word when we come back. Well, that was informative. Let's uh, switch gears completely for tomorrow night and bring on the new head basketball coach at the University of Rhode Island, David Cox. We've already recorded the conversation, so uh, I know that he's got a lot to say in terms of, and offered a lot of insight in terms of the process and how he got hired, you know, as Dan Hurley scooted off to UConn and how he earned that gig. So that's tomorrow night here on My State of Mind. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to tune in tomorrow afternoon, weekdays, 3 to 6 on WPRO, and give us a jingle. Have a great night. See you.